All right, let's get into the chapter six addendum for those topics that I just could not make a single video about. Uh, I'm covering A6.8, A6.9, and A6.10 in the textbook. Um, a lot of the other Apply the Concepts stuff that I skipped between the last video and this one were more examples of functions and proceed, uh, sorry, sub procedures, all that kind of stuff. Uh, worth looking into if you want more examples. And as always, I recommend that you look through all of these uh, sections, no matter what, because they give you good ways of following along with everything. But that's what I'm covering very briefly in this video. All right, so first off, uh, I wanna talk about validating your application's code. You want to make sure that your code works right. You want the application to work properly, especially as things get more and more and more complicated. You're getting longer procedures, which hopefully you're starting to break into sub procedures if you need to, but you're getting longer procedures, you're getting more procedures, you're handling more events, you're trying to cut down on duplicate code, all of that kind of stuff, you have to test to make sure everything functions properly. Now, there's a lot of ways that some things can be tricky, like with procedure calls or loops, you know, loop behavior, all that kind of stuff. Right now, what I want to focus on is selection structures because they can be particularly tricky. You have to test every possible unique path through the flowchart. And this is where flowcharts are super useful because you can make test cases for every single possible path that takes you to the end of your program or even of your individual procedure. And if you have flowcharts for every single procedure that you're making, then you can be sure that every single procedure that you're making is going to be very uh, well tested. You also want to test edge cases with your selection structures for things like uh, if you have comparisons, such as if some value is less than or equal to zero, um, or sorry, some variable is less than or equal to zero, then otherwise, if the variable is greater than zero, do this. Um, you want to test the variable at zero, you know, test that edge case between the different, uh, you know, the, between the different things. Uh, this is especially true, like, when you um, are creating your pseudocode or your flowchart and you say, okay, well, I, I know that if my, if my grade is an A, then I'm going to do this. If my grade is a B, then I'm going to do this. And then you implement that into code. Uh, when you say, okay, well, I'm trying to figure out if my grade is an A, you take in the score. The score should be between 90 and 100. You want to, or sorry, the score should be at least 90. But you want to make sure that it's working at 90 and that it's going through the A category, not the B category, because it would be very easy to accidentally say, if grade is greater than 90, and then accidentally turn 90 into a B instead of an A. So that, that's one example of what I mean by edge cases. But selection structures are tricky. You gotta make sure that every possible unique path is working. All right, so what we have here is an application that um, an employee can put in their name. You know, they're a sales employee, by the way. They can put in their name, they can put in their level, and they can put in how much they have sold, and then it calculates their gross pay. Now, um, let's see. Oh, we'll talk about this soon. But what happens is the um, calculate button is clicked after the employee has already put in their, their information, uh, and they get their based on the level and based on the sales, right? First off, you want to check the employee's level because the employee's level is going to determine how much they're actually making. It's sort of a promotion structure. Um, and we have one selection structure right here. Uh, level one, level two, level three, level four. That is four possibilities already. Now, for each possibility, there's a unique function. Um, right there. And what happens is we're going to ignore this as well right now. But what happens is inside of each of these, uh, and they're 
being silly by varying between uh, pass by ref uh, sub function uh, sub procedures and functions that return things. Uh, but in each of these functions, they have an if statement. If the sales amount is greater than some number, then the pay gets uh, increased by some certain commission. Uh, and this happens for each of these levels, which means we have four choices for what level the user can choose. And then there's two choices for whether or not they made enough money to get that bonus. In total, there are eight paths that we should test. Now, of course, uh, well, no, no, there's no shortcut here, especially because uh, things work very differently in level three and four than they do level one and two. But what you would do is you would manually make these calculations for each of the eight cases, right? You would choose a um, value for sales amount that will go into this if statement. So let's say 10,001. And you also choose a level, should be one. And then you do the calculations. So you go to the get L1 gross thing right here. For 10,001, you uh, say, okay, well, double pay is 400 uh, plus equals 0 0.01 times 10,001 minus 10,000. So one, uh, one cent. So you would expect to get $400.01, right? That's how you would, um, you would calculate that out by hand. And then you would run the program. Let's do it right now. Curious color, sales 400, or 10,001, just like that. And look, I've made $400.01. cent. Look at that wonderful bonus that they gave me. This company really values me, let me tell you. But let's say I made 10,000. We're checking the edge cases here. I would expect this to be 400. And that's what we get. And if I put in $3, I've been working real hard, I put in $3, I would expect that to be 400 as well. Now, um, I can check level two right here. Uh, my base pay is 200, but I get 5% over 10,000. So if I did 10,001, I'm cheating a little bit. I'm making it very easy on myself, but you could really, you know, pull out a calculator and do this by yourself. I'm just doing mental math on uh, recording with a hot mic. It is very nerve wracking. $10,001 in sales. Uh, means that I get end up with 1 times 5%, which is 5%, of course. Um, and that would be uh, 200 plus 5%, or plus uh, 5 cents. Which is kind of a raw deal, but you would expect me, if I'm a level 2 salesman, I would probably be getting way higher than 10,000, so this 5% would hopefully make up for the fact that the base pay is 200. That, I, I would imagine that's the idea. However, if I don't have a good sales uh, period, then my pay should be 200, I would expect, which it is. So that kind of thing. That is four tests right there, right? Four tests where I have um, tested every possible branch for level one and every possible branch for level two. You would need to do four more for level three and level four.
So that, oh, we'll talk about, we'll talk about this in a sec. So that's the idea with testing like this. Now look, I'm a disgruntled employee. I, I can't take this anymore. This company clearly doesn't value me. So I'm going to activate a secret little thing called the uh, money laundering loop. I have a function, it's all the way up here. You know, if I'm trying to hide this thing, I probably shouldn't put it at the very top, right? But I have my is money laundering function where all I do is I check the name. And if that name is Iris Kohler, then give me more money. Well, I guess uh, if the name is Iris Kohler, then is money laundering Iris Kohler is true. So that, you know, that's just a, the signal that I am here. I am money laundering. That's what I'm actually doing right here as well. Sternname equals Iris Kohler. Remember that when you have a variable name at the beginning of a statement like this, this is variable assignment. However, since there's a return right here, this is not variable assignment. This is Boolean comparison. I'm asking, or in this case, string comparison, my bad. But I'm asking if whatever is in sternname, is that the same as the string containing iris color? And whatever this evaluates to, true or false, I return it. So if I typed in, if I passed in my name, iris color, this would be true. If I uh, passed in my cat's name, little Miss Marley, uh, that would be false. Or any other name would be false. Now, with the money laundering loop, what I'm testing right here, at the very beginning of everything, is the name equal to Iris Kohler. That's essentially what's happening here. Um, is money laundering, if is money laundering, when I pass in string name, is true, then uh, we pay me the very normal amount of $1 million, which is fair compensation, I would say, for my work, and then we exit immediately. Otherwise, we have all this other stuff happening. Now, you would think that this might, or you might think that this makes things even more complicated. Because I have to test for, you know, we have eight branches already. What level the salesperson is in and how much they made, whether it was over or under 10,000. But now I also have to check if their name was Iris Kohler or not. Which means every one of those branches has an additional two branches, which means, what was it, 16 checks? Because Iris Kohler level one, $10,001 is one million. But Little Miss Marley level one, $10,001 is $400 and one cent, right? Well, it's not so hard, luckily. It actually only adds one more test as long as for all the other tests, we don't use my name. And the reason why is because of this exit sub right here. It happens before all of this stuff happens. If I put it at the end, that would be a different story. But because it happens before the select case, there's not 16. There's only nine. The one case where we test my name, it doesn't matter what else I put in for the level or the sales because the level or the sales aren't even touched by this part of the code. All we have to worry about is, is the name Iris Kohler? If so, make sure that 
it's 1 million. In all other cases, when the name is not Iris Kohler, then we can worry about the level of the employee. Then we can worry about the sales. So let's see what that looks like. All right, so I have the application up. I have money laundering mode on. Um, I type my name. You know, one dollar in sales. I was I was really putting in the effort this this period. And look at that, it paid off. Fair pay for hard work, don't you think? Let me change the level there. Uh, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. I mean, I'm rising up. I'm going all, all sorts of directions in the ranks right here. Uh, maybe I was actually working really hard. That'd be the problem with this, though, is because I've put so many zeros in here, right? Um, I've so I've sold so much. I would have made more money if I if I didn't mess with the uh, application. But that you know, that's beside the point, right? Um, uh, let's get all that out of there. All right, now. It, it, so it doesn't matter what the level is, what the sales are. If my name is there, my pay is one million dollars. I can't even put in blank sales. It doesn't matter because we weren't doing anything with the blank sales because this was before I even tried parsing the sales. So it's very nice. Now, if we put in my cat's name, uh, That's her, that's her full legal name, by the way, Miss Marley Stinkhead the Fourth. Now this is where we start um, testing the application. So, you know, she, Marley sells $1 worth of stuff. That's pretty accurate for her. She doesn't really put in a lot of hard work. She just sits around. Um, so she gets a gross pay of $400, but she's probably going to get fired soon, let's be real. Uh, well, she doesn't want that, so she puts her butt in gear. Uh, 10,001, we expect uh, one cent over, and she gets one cent over. So this is where, you know, we put in a name that's not mine for every other case, and then we test every other case for every level and also above and below that um, amount in the if statement. So that's how you actually go about validating your code when it comes to the, um, when it actually comes to making sure that things are working properly. And then you can kind of expand this as well to repetition structures, um, since they're kind of like selection structures, but weird. You know, they have a true path and a false path. One of them continues and goes on to the next loop. One of them exits, but you can do things like test what happens if the um, condition is true, like starts out as either true or false, depending. You can test what happens when you um, don't enter at all, or you know if you have a um, post test loop, you can test you can test and see what happens like when. You do loop the fir the first time versus when you don't loop the first time you just exit like all that kind of stuff you can you can test it works a little bit differently with loops but there's some similarities as like uh, similarities to selection structures and for loops as well you can test the your for loops um, make sure they're hitting all the correct values and make sure they're stopping when they're supposed to all that good stuff. All right, well, we can move on to the next topic now. And oh, well, you know, I guess we can finally talk about this thing right here. This is called the message box. Um, yeah, let's get into that a little more. So the message box, as you saw, pops up a message box for the user. It's a good way to communicate important or urgent information. You can help double check that the user wants to end the program, cancel an operation that's in progress, all that kind of stuff. You can caution and warn and alert the user. They're super useful. All right, so you use the message box dot show method to um, actually get yourself a message box like this. Uh, this is a method. It's the show method of the message box class. Uh, it is a sub procedure. It is not a function. Now, there's a lot going on in here. Uh, I'll try to summarize it very briefly. 
but you'll want to probably refer to this uh, in section A6.9 in the textbook. Um, you have a whole bunch of arguments. The text is the text to actually display in the message box and you use sentence capitalization. It's you're, you're talking to the uh, user normally saying like, do you really want to exit or record deleted or delete the record or empty the recycling bin? You know, that kind of stuff. The uh, caption is the text to display in the title bar. Uh, you use book capitalization as if you were uh, titling a book. So every word except for prepositions capitalized. Uh, the buttons. They are buttons to display in the message box. They can be one of the following constants. You actually type these out when you're creating a message box. So you would type out, say, message box buttons dot OK, which is default. Or message box buttons dot retry cancel. All of these um, actually uh, dictate what the captions on the buttons on this message box will be. So what you saw before with the exit message box that was uh, used with message box buttons dot yes no. Uh, icon is the icon that actually displays whether that is uh, the exclamation, you know, yellow triangle exclamation mark, the information, the blue I, or stop, the red X, depending on what you want to uh, communicate to your user. Whether you're telling them something, or whether you're saying, hey, watch out, this is happening, or whether you're saying a really bad error happened, something like that. Uh, and then there's default buttons. Uh, Sort of like how the accept button works with um, when you're creating your own application. Default button is the one automatically selected when the user presses enter. Um, you can select button one, button two, or button three. Uh, only some of those will be valid depending on the number of buttons that are there. And the number of buttons are going to be specified by your buttons argument. So abort, retry, ignore is going to have three of them, so you can do one, two, or three. But OK is going to just have one button, so you can only use button one. Now, a couple of examples right here. Uh, you would just type something like this out in your code, so message box.show. In this case, it's record deleted is the text that actually shows up in the thing. Uh, payroll is the caption. They chose message box buttons.ok, which means only the OK button shows up. Message box icon dot information means this I thing shows up. And you'll notice uh, the uh, default button doesn't show up because you'll see right here, default setting. This is something called the default argument. <laughs> it's it's frustrating because it's it's that um, that exception to the you must pass in as many arguments as there are parameters. You know, I could put a little asterisk there and say except when there are default parameters and you kind of have to know when there are. Uh, but you'll see there's a default setting up here, message box buttons dot okay, right? The fact that this has a default setting means that th the way that default settings work in Visual Studio, you can't specify an icon without saying what the buttons are, because if you ignored the buttons and put the icon, Visual Studio would assume that you're putting whatever you chose for icon is actually what you're trying to pass into buttons and it says, hey, this isn't valid. Get out of here. Or even worse, uh, if these are just constants that translate directly to numbers, then your choice for icon might end up being a valid button layout, but it's one that you don't want or whatever. So what ends up happening instead is uh, we know that there's a default setting right here for buttons, which means that there must be a default setting for icon. It's just not shown in here because we're just worrying about the most common ones. But default button for... I'm oh, sorry, there's a default setting for default button as well. Because when you say that there's a default setting for one of these arguments, every argument after that also has to have a default setting. But that also means that you can't 
say what the icon is without specifying what the buttons are. They have to be specified in order still. So you can forget default button. That's totally fine. You can forget default button and icon. That's totally fine. You cannot forget buttons while remembering icon and default button. That's not okay. But you could just put text and caption and that would be fine. All right, well, we're back to the examples. There's no default button right here. Totally fine not to specify when you have message box buttons dot okay. However, if you had something like this where you have two buttons, but you wanted the first button to be the default button, I would specify it specifically to communicate that you're not specifying button two. Um, I would highly recommend that. Uh, also, we have, um, yeah, we, we have the two button example right here. We have the, the example of the different icons that are being chosen. All that good stuff. Now, there are GUI design guidelines for messagebox.show. In the textbook, they're at the very um, end after all of the apply the concepts sections. Uh, in figure 6-47, they're also in appendix A, as are all of the GUI design guidelines. By the way, I would recommend you, um, you do try to take a look through appendix A sometime, especially if you are trying to cross-reference any uh, GUI stuff. Now the message box uh, method, I believe I, I believe I said it was a uh, sub procedure. My apologies. It is a function because it has a return value, which communicates what the option the user actually chose. Uh, those possible options are going to be based on what buttons were provided. So whether they chose yes or no is going to be different than if they chose OK versus cancel. Uh, yes is different than OK. No is different than cancel. All, all that kind of stuff. Cancel is different than abort. That's an interesting one. But you can catch it in an if statement and determine what action to take. Uh, and there are constants that you get to use rather than using the actual integer literals. All right, so here are um, the constants that get returned from messagebox.show as well as some examples. Um, Dialog result dot OK is a constant that just holds the integer one. Dot cancel is a constant that holds the integer two. Abort is three. Retry is four. Ignore is five. Yes is six. No is seven. Um, and you can use these constants to check the result of a message box because whatever the user chose that will get saved as one of these integers into um, or my, my apologies, it will get returned uh, as one of those integers. So right here, we have um, two ways of doing it. You can set some variable equal to the output of message box and then compare that variable to dialog result dot yes in this case, but it could be dialog result dot whatever. Um, and the second example, this is just a direct comparison you uh, use the message box and then some clever uses of line breaks after commas uh, and then compare that equal to whatever dialogue results you want. Uh, and then what's nice is that if you have a two button, um, a, a one or two button uh, message box, you only need to check, like you, you can check uh, words. You have a very easy um, set of stuff to check. For example, uh, with yes, no, you could do it so that you have one action if the user hits yes and nothing happens if the user hits no. Or you can have it so that one action happens if the user hits yes, another one happens if the user hits no. Uh, and of course, since there are only two options for yes, no, you can do if and else. Because, it, you know, if you can check if it's equal to yes, if it's not equal to yes, then it must be no. So you can go under the else statement. Uh, you don't always need to check equal to one, equal to two, equal to three, equal to four, equal to five. You don't need to do your case statements or anything like that. You don't need to worry about that because uh, you'll always have, you know, yes and no together, but you won't have okay and no together, right? So you can 
check based on the um, message box buttons right here what three, two, or one number of values you need to check for in your if statement. Now, of course, if you did um, a three button choice, then you have a few more things you need to check. But yeah, it all depends on what purpose you're trying to use the message, message box for, what you want to communicate to the user. All right, so what I have here is the uh, sales application that I was showing you before, where we saw the message box for the first time. Now, if I hit no on this message box that is asking me, do I want to exit? If I hit no, then it doesn't exit. But if I hit yes, then it closes. Now, the interesting thing is that when I hit this exit button, the exit button is doing me.close. So it's telling the application to close itself. But then this message box pops up and allows me to interrupt it from closing itself. So it tries to close. I click no, and then it stops closing. But if I click yes, it's allowed to continue to close. And the reason why is because it's using this uh, form main underscore form closing procedure, which is handling, you guessed it, me dot form closing me being form main in this case but it's handling the form closing event of form main of me uh remember that me is sort of a a way for form main to refer to refer to itself and we are in fact in form main regardless um come back up here when the closing event happens, you know, the closing event happens when I'm trying to close the application. And it's not just when I'm trying to hit exit and me.close gets called. It's also when I try to click the uh, X button, the close button up there on the upper right. So any time that I'm trying to close the application in a normal way, uh, the application will have this form closing event. And then in this case, we have it caught by the event procedure and in the event procedure uh we have this um dialog button variable of type dialog result now dialog result is kind of a type uh it is something called an enum which is very complicated we're not going to get into it but it's essentially Assigning these val these values, uh, like no, to an integer or yes to an integer and all that kind of stuff. So dialog result is kind of a family of special values, where these special values are assigned to those integers. But that's what's happening here. Dialog button. We have a variable dialog button. It has the type dialog result. Um, it's very fancy. A uh, dialog button we're setting equal to the output of message message box. So whatever I choose, if I choose yes, dialog result dot yes gets put into dialog button. If I choose no, dialog result dot no gets put into dialog button. Now, if we want the application to close, if I choose yes, I want the application to close which means that the procedure doesn't have to do anything special. It can just let it go. What the procedure wants to do is it wants to change something if I choose no. So that's why we're checking if what I selected is equal to no. If I clicked the no button, then we need to cancel this thing. And we do that by canceling the, um, we cancel the event. Notice, by the way, this is form closing event args, which is different than the event args that we have uh, in this area or some of the event args other in other areas. We see things like key press args. That's what I was talking about earlier about having different parameters. You couldn't have something that handled button dot uh, button calc underscore click and form main underscore form closing. Not underscore, I apologize. Um, we couldn't have a event procedure handle the 
form closing event and the button click event. I uh, those would not gel because this E event is a different type than the button event. And it would be a different type than the key press or the key press event thing for um handling key press and stuff like that. That's that's what I'm talking about with the different parameters. I got a little sidetrack, I apologize. Anyway, if the dialog result dot is no, then we set this form closing event args um, cancel property to be true. Normally it's false. We set it to true to say that, hey, we are canceling this completely. And it completely prevents the um, shutdown from happening. So this uh, event procedure gets invoked before, after I say I want to close the application and after, you know, me.close is invoked, but before it actually starts shutting things down. So in between when I click exit and when it starts shutting things down, it sends out this event and sees if there's an event procedure that handles it. And there is. So it breaks into this procedure and says, hey, please, please take care of this really quick. And it that's when the message box is shown. And it checks to see if I selected no. And if I did, then it cancels it and stops the shutdown completely. And if I hit yes, nothing happens. The uh, procedure ends. Shutdown happens and the application closes. All right, so a brief recap on the form closing event procedure. It's, uh, you know, the event procedure itself is called when the user wants to exit, whether that's through me.close or by clicking the X button. A.cancel is a Boolean property, false by default. You set it to true to cancel the form closing event, which means that the application doesn't actually close. Works great with message boxes. Use this knowledge wisely because you could make an application that is impossible to actually close from. And you can even make it frustrating where you just put a.cancel equals true as the only thing inside of the form closing event procedure. Um, and then the user would have no idea why the application isn't closing. Don't do that. It's, I mean, look, if you want to pull a prank, you can do it. This gives you a lot of power to pull pranks on, on people with weird Windows applications. But don't do it. Alright, that's all for chapter 6. Uh, thank you for tagging along.